expected his duty to do Was the last signal made to the British fleet's crew Let your watchword be Nelson, ye sons of the main When you fight and you conquer again and again Success to old England, the land of the free Success to our sovereign, the queen of the sea Success to our sailors, the lords of the main Success to the navy again and again May I, for my own self-songs, truth reckon Journey's jargon, how I, in harsh days, hardship endured oft Bitter breast cares have I abided, known on my keel many a cares hold, and dire sea surge, and there I oft spent narrow night watch, neither ship's head, while she tossed close to cliffs. Courageous in his deeds, nor is Lord so gracious to him that he never worries about his seafaring. As to what the Lord will send him, he will have no thought for the harp nor for the ring-receiving ceremonial, nor for the pleasure of a woman, nor for trust in that which is of the world, nor for anything else, but only for the surging of the waves. And yet he who aspires to the ocean always has the yearning. That was from the poem The Seafarer, which was written over a thousand years ago by our English ancestors. And it sums up the almost mystical natural bond that we British have with the sea. It expresses the dangers and discomforts suffered by sailors, the loneliness, the long periods from home and family, but also the thrill, the quest for exploration, the drive to be there in the salty sea breeze and in the gales, the longing to return to the sea for all its dangers felt the maritime men, experiences that can never be understood, perhaps, by those of us who've never answered the call to the sea. And it sums up the importance that the sea has had for our people since the very foundation of our nation, born as it was from seafarers who crossed the narrow seas from continental Europe, closely related tribes of Celts, Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Danes and Norsemen. In Britain, we're never more than about 75 miles from the sea, and perhaps because of this, there was a time, not so long ago, when it was felt that the British had an almost unique feel for the sea. Just 100 years ago, our navy was bigger than that of the next three biggest powers combined. A merchant fleet was massive, bigger than all of the rest of the world put together. Britain dominated the seas worldwide, militarily and in terms of trade. And at the same time, we created the greatest empire the world had ever seen, backed up by the guns and the long reach of the British Navy. This tradition has died out in Britain. Will it ever reassert itself? Many of our greatest heroes were naval men. Drake, Raleigh, Hawkins, Hood. But the naval victories won by the greatest of them all paved the way for that worldwide empire and worldwide naval domination that was still in place a hundred years after his death. That man, that star, that ultimate national celebrity, that hero was Nelson. England's greatest ever naval hero, Horatio Nelson, was born at Parsonage House in Burnham Thorpe, about a mile from here, on the 29th of September 1758. His father, Edmund Nelson, was the vicar at this church, which is Burnham Thorpe All Saints, here behind me. Uh, Ed Edmund Nelson had, by modern standards, a huge family of 11 children. Three of them died young, a number of Horatio's brothers and sisters are actually still buried in the churchyard here. This is the burn of Burnham Thorpe. Right outside Nelson's birthplace, Nelson almost certainly played in this little stream when he was a youngster.
just a couple of miles north of Nelson's home uh, is another burn and Burnham Overy. And the, the burn, the little stream that we saw by his village home, by the time it gets to Burnham Overy is a, a fair size little stream and it's become tidal. And uh, before the coming of the railways and effective road transport, rivers like this were really important to the farmers and tradesmen of a local area. And this, amazingly enough, was really quite a busy little seaport. Uh, it's uh, Burnham Overy Stave, and a stave is the local dialect word for a, a sort of jetty in harbour. And uh, basically, it's still here, just behind me. If you imagine this at high tide, you could get a fair size uh, trading vessel up against this wall here for loading and offloading agricultural produce, things like that. And Nelson must have come here as quite a young boy and seen a very busy, bustling place compared with his little village with, among other things, sailors. Not um, Royal Navy seamen for sure, but um, merchant seamen, a little bit exotic and so on. He must have looked at these and thought, well, that's daring, I want to be daring, perhaps I'll go to sea. And this is the place, it's known that, this is the place he used to come, there was, even in those days, there was a sailing club here, and this is where he first came to learn how to sail. So it's a walk or a short pony ride from his home, and he came here, and as a young lad, messed about in boats, just as kids today still do along here, along the river along here. Unfortunately, Nelson's birthplace was pulled down in 1801, and all that's left is a plaque on a nearby wall. The church, however, which dates from the 13th century, it's a lovely example of a Norfolk church, uh, built a lot of it with the local flints uh, from the fields around here. Uh, it's still very much there. There's a lot of Nelson memorabilia inside and it's well worth a look. Just inside the church and to the right hand side of the entrance is the ship's crest from HMS Nelson. Uh, this was a major British battleship during the Second World War and the crest and the two huge flags at the west end of the nave were presented from HMS Nelson in 1955, the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. At the east end of each of the church's naves there are even older relics of the British Navy. These are the two flags from HMS Indomitable which were flown at the Battle of Jutland during the First World War. The flag flying over the church here is very rare, it's, I think this church is probably the only place in England outside of naval establishments even allowed to fly it. It's the pre-1801 white ensign, the Royal Navy battle flag. Uh, if you look at it really carefully, you can see that there's no Cross of St Patrick. 1801 was when Ireland joined the Union, and at that point the Cross of St Patrick was added to the flag, so this is the version that predates that. Also, very important from the point of view of the Nelson story, this is the version of the White Ensign that was flown at the Battle of the Nile in 1798. This medieval font, probably as old as the church itself, is actually where Horatio Nelson, or as his family sometimes called him Horace Nelson, was christened as a young baby. Uh, it's interesting, if you look at the font, there are bare panels all around it. Before the Reformation, these would have been covered probably in pictures of the saints and so on, but uh, they were all destroyed by the Puritans at the time of the Reformation, and this very bare, plain, simple font is as Nelson would have remembered it as a boy. Another piece of the pre-Reformation church, which would have been destroyed almost certainly during the Reformation, would have been the rood screen. But in this instance, there's been a new one put in more recently, and this is actually made of wood from HMS Victory, given by the Admiralty to this church to remake the rood screen that you see now. Nelson's parents are actually buried in the chancel of the church, which is the, the lower part of the building at this end, their gravestones are still there. His mother died when he was very young. He was only nine when she died. So her gravestone made no reference to Nelson because he was an unknown schoolboy at the time. His father lived on to a fairly ripe old age and was later on buried next to Nelson's mother. Because Edmund Nelson was the vicar of this All Saints Church, when he died, Nelson and other members of his surviving brothers and sisters paid to put a plaque to the old vicar up on the wall and just below that there's actually a bust of Nelson himself 
which was given by the East Anglian Society on the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar. In November 1767, Nelson left the village school and his family and went to a boarding school in Norwich, Norwich Grammar School, a 14th century foundation school in the Cathedral Close. The young Nelson had only been at the school for one month when on Boxing Day of that year his mother suddenly died. After that though her brother, the childless Captain Morris Suckling from the Royal Navy, took a great interest in the young boy's schooling and development. In September 1768, Nelson left uh, the school in Norwich and switched to the Paston School in North Walsham. To a long to tell of all who came, of Woodhouse, Wharton, Host, their names are on the roll of fame and never shall be lost. But stand and shout as the last we bring, Horatio Nelson of him we sing, for he is our proudest boast. His eye was clear and his head was cool, his glory is our star. For what he learnt at the Paston School, he taught at Trafalgar. Such was the Paston School, such is the Paston School, and we will see that such shall be forever the Paston School. The headmaster at Paston School was the Reverend Jones, and he had a reputation for being a very strict disciplinarian. He had a great big pear tree in the grounds of the school that he was very proud of, and on it was very large, ripe pears that the other children at the school all looked on with envious eyes. Nelson climbed out of his dormitory window one night, sneaked up to the pear tree, climbed up and took bagfuls of pears back to his schoolmates. Nelson didn't even like pears. As he said himself, I only took them because every other boy was afraid. So popular was Nelson that even though the Reverend Jones offered five guineas to, for the culprit to be handed in, no one sneaked on him. In later years, the stories of children scrumping apples became a stock in trade, particularly in Victorian boys' own stories. It was essentially a victimless crime, but one that took a bit of pluck. And it was due to Nelson's influence that this tradition, this minor literary tradition, came about. I don't even like pears. At the end of 1770, Horatio and his brother William saw in the local paper that HMS Raisin Raisonable was being kitted out in Chatham under the command of Captain Morris Suckling, their uncle. There was the possibility of a war with Spain over the Falkland Islands, and that's why this ship, which had been captured from the French and so had a French name, was being kitted out for the Royal Navy. Horatio got his brother, William, to write to their father, who was at Bath at the time, recuperating from an illness, to ask if he could get his uncle to take him on board ship. Morris Suckling wrote us a jokey letter back, and this is what he said. What has poor Horace done, who is so weak, that he, above all the rest, should be sent to rough it out at sea? But let him come, and the first time we go into action, a cannonball may knock off his head and provide for him at once. Nelson was put on the books of HMS Reasonable from December 1770, but didn't actually come down to the ship until March 1771. He set off from Paston School by coach to King's Lynn, with his father from King's Lynn to London, and then was packed off on his own by coach from London to Chatham. But at the age of 12, Nelson arrived at Chatham on his own. He had to find his way from where the coach stopped to the port, and from the port he had to wander about looking for his ship. There was no one to tell him. He had to wander about for a whole day and a night up and down the harbour front looking for his ship. When I was young and scarce 18, I drove a rolling train. And many's a sly trick I've played with many's a pretty fair mate My parents found that would not do They soon would see my fate They resolved that I should go to sea aboard a 98 After spending a considerable amount of time wandering around the harbour, eventually a kindly naval officer took pity on young Nelson pointed out the ship and got a 
boat arranged to take him out to it. Unfortunately, when Nelson arrived on the Reasonable, his uncle wasn't there to meet him and no one was expecting him. He spent a whole day and night again pacing up and down, abandoned on the ship, totally alone while the busy business of the port went on around him. At long last, one of the officers on the ship took Nelson down below to the midshipmen's quarters. A couple of days later, Captain Suckling arrived and Nelson's naval career started. It was, however, some time before Nelson actually saw any action. The threatened war with Spain over the Falklands blew over and Nelson was stood down. By August of 1771, it was clear that the war scare with Spain and the Falklands wasn't going to come to anything. So Nelson's uncle had him seconded to the merchant navy so he could go on a long voyage and learn his trade as a genuine seaman. Uh, he went on a long voyage to the West Indies where he almost certainly caught the malaria that plagued him on and off for the rest of his life. Nelson was a very sickly child, constantly ill, constantly suffering in injuries and so on, but nevertheless he was always bold, wasn't he? Yes, the first instance of this uh, where his boldness came to the fore was probably in 1773 when he was 15 and he went on a, he volunteered for a polar trip, a polar exploration trip to the uh, Arctic and uh, while the, tr the ship he was on was stuck in an ice floe, him and one of his messmates went out across the ice floe to attack a polar bear with a one-shot musket and uh, the musket inevitably failed to fire. The bear was about to attack him, he turned around the the musket to try and hit it with the with the butt end. Uh, Nelson, a tiny little boy against this massive polar bear, he was only saved from being ripped apart by someone on the ship noticing them away and firing a cannon which uh, scared the bear away. He was given a complete bollocking by the captain uh, for this. Uh, typical Nelson refused really to be told off for it. He said he wanted to take the bear skin home to his father. And that really summarised uh, Nelson, a tiny kid as a juvenile he was very small and uh, but had unlimited courage and uh, determination. In April 1777 Nelson passed his exam as a lieutenant and was soon after appointed to a frigate for service in the American War of Independence. During the American War of Independence Nelson engaged in numerous actions primarily in the West Indies and met his lifelong friend Collingwood. At the young age of 20, Nelson was promoted captain, but about a year later he was invalided home to England in 1780 with another attack of malaria. The American War of Independence ended in September 1783, which allowed Nelson the opportunity to go on, on his one and only holiday to France. But he ended up saying, after this holiday, that he hated the French and their manners. This hatred of the French was one of the big motivations for the rest of his career. In 1787, Nelson married Francis Nisbet and shortly afterwards was put on half pay as peace had broken out and, as usual in such circumstances, the Navy was cut to the bone. Nelson took being put on half pay very badly. He got into what you'd now call a bit of a sulk about it and he, wrote, he said to one of his brother officers, it will release me forever from an ungrateful service for it is my firm and unalterable determination never again to set foot upon a king's ship. In actual fact, this brother officer warned the authorities that Nelson was planning to uh, resign in disgust. He was introduced to the king and the king uh, flattered him and soothed him and Nelson carried on on half pay until the next great war came ten years or so later. In the grounds of Parsonage House, Nelson had a big pond dug in the shape of a man of war. It was about 100 feet long and if we look over the fence here we can see it's still there and we'll try and sneak in and have a closer look. Nelson never forgot his village. When he won prize money for his naval victories he donated it to help his community. Nelson wanted to get something done to help the local rural poor and so he wrote to the future King William IV, who he had met in the West Indies, concerning this. Nelson always defended the underdog, whether it was the ordinary sailor or the underpaid local farm labourers. Nelson wasn't 
really happy as a man of peace. He was a man of action. Uh, he thrived on having his ships and his crew drilled and trained, and he needed an opponent, really, I think, to make this happen. So he wasn't really a, peace, a peacetime sailor. Uh, he chafed against only being a captain, although still only in his 20s. He felt that he was a far better seaman, as indeed he was than many senior officers. He wanted to be up there leading the whole damn show, I think, from a very, very early age. So he was one of the people who was absolutely delighted when in 1793 the French Revolutionary Wars broke out. Britain again was at war and he was called to go to sea. He was so pleased that uh, before he left Burnham Thorpe, he threw a huge party for everyone in the village, actually in this pub which now called the Lord Nelson in those days was called the Plough. Now it actually obviously there's Lord Nelson pubs all over the country but this was the very first one. This actually became the Lord Nelson in 1798 immediately after the Battle of the Nile. So it's an absolute first for there. It's been the Lord Nelson ever since. But you can just imagine there's still quite young officer so pleased to be going back to sea and to war despite everything he knew it meant that um, he had everyone from the village in there in the pub, it really was his local. He was known to drink there in any case, but he uh, splashed out possibly even, I suppose, an advance on his coming wages for the war or future prize money, splashed out, they had a huge slap up meal in there, everyone in the village, then he went off to the war. Like the seafarer in the Anglo-Saxon poem, Nelson had been fretting while on land at Burnham Thorpe. Now with the French Revolutionary Wars, he was appointed to the command of the Agamemnon, a 64-gun ship. He was to say this ship was the favourite ship that he sailed in in his entire time in the Navy. Nelson said of his crew, my seamen are now what British seamen ought to be, almost invincible. In July 1793, Nelson sailed in the Agamemnon for the Mediterranean to blockade the French naval port of Toulon. Nelson took his midshipmen together on the Agamemnon and said to them, there are three things, young gentlemen, which you are constantly to bear in mind. First, you must always implicitly obey orders without attempting to form any opinion of your own respecting their propriety. Well, Nelson wasn't actually very good at doing that himself, I have to say. Secondly, you must consider every man your enemy who speaks ill of your king, meaning, of course, country. And thirdly, you must hate a Frenchman as you do the devil. Nelson, as we saw earlier, was implacably anti-French. For example, he said on another occasion, it was always, I was always of the opinion and have ever acted upon it and have never had any reason to repent it that one Englishman was the equal of three Frenchmen. And as we will see through his naval career, he actually put this into practice, whether it was Frenchmen or Spaniards, he never shirked when, it was, when he was up against it in terms of odds. Nelson was in action in Corsica at the Siege of Calvi in July 1794 when he suffered the first of his famous injuries. A cannonball landed on the ground near to his right side, throwing up pieces of debris and stones. One of these stones, at no particular velocity, hit him on the right side of the forehead right by his eye. It didn't take the eye out, but it caused the retina to detach, with the result that shortly afterwards he progressively lost the sight in that eye. He never lost the eye, that's a complete myth. Uh, in fact, he said that once the wound had settled down, he really couldn't tell if he didn't know that he was blind in one eye, but he was for the rest of his life. Near the end of his life, in fact, as a consequence, the other eye was beginning to go, but he died before this became a serious problem. During numerous small actions in the first phases of the French Revolutionary Wars, Nelson distinguished himself greatly. Yeah, in fact, he became, as time went on, a bit of a, what would now be known as a publicity hound. Uh, and clearly he's pushing himself forward. He wasn't boasting vainly. He'd actually done, even by that stage, really great things. But uh, he obviously rubbed some people up his superiors, rubbed them up the wrong way, either by indicating he could have done it better or wanted to take every single bit of credit he could get. Uh, and it clearly made his career path with the people above him somewhat difficult, but at the same time he was such a magnetic character and so obviously deserved the praise that um, 
the seamen underneath him loved him, served him, and they'd go through anything for him. And in many of the actions, that made all the difference, didn't it? Yeah, most certainly. Life on board a Royal Navy ship in Nelson's time was hard, although perhaps not necessarily harder than many other professions. Some of the sailors were press ganged, trained merchant seamen in particular were often press ganged, others were minor criminals, but a good half of the crew of a ship like the Victory were volunteers. One of the reasons they volunteered was that in the British Navy, as a general rule, especially on active service, really, although conditions were bad, the diet was unusually good. With their ample wholesome diet and continual exercise, the crew of a British naval ship of this time were stocky but immensely strong men. When they were attacking French or Spanish ships on boarding parties, they were armed with swords, cutlasses, coches and axes. These fights were absolutely brutal, but very frequently pretty quick because there were very few French or Spaniards who wanted to stand up against a boarding party of British sailors. This is a 24 pounder, 24 pounds being the weight of the shell that was fired from this gun. It's twice the size of a land cannon for a land battle like the Battle of Waterloo. The biggest gun was a 12 pounder, because had to rely on horses to carry them around and those guns would get stuck in the fields. These big guns were held, once they were put on the ship they were there and that's why they had the biggest guns available to them on our ships. A crew of 12 was used to man these guns. They could fire them once every 90 seconds and fired them with a ripple effect, one gun after the other. If they fired the broadside all at once, the whole ship would have been destroyed. The French took twice as long to fire their guns. This gave us a massive fighting edge over our enemies. In March 1776, Nelson was promoted to Commodore and soon afterwards, Spain joined France against Britain in the war. This put us in a very dangerous strategic situation with the French and Spanish navies potentially combining against us. Nelson joined the fleet off Gibraltar to sort the Spanish out. Spain. We've got the Mediterranean Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, Gibraltar in between. Close by, the main Spanish naval port of Cadiz. Interestingly enough, separating the two Cape Trafalgar. Mm -hmm but this battle took place at Cape St Vincent off the southern coast of Spain here. The British fleet was commanded by Sir John Jervis. He had 15 ships, the Spanish 27, almost two to one. Jervis was on HMS Victory. That was his flagship at this battle. The captain of HMS Victory had an interesting exchange with Jervis as the Spanish fleet approached. It went like this. The captain said, There are eight sail of the line, Sir John. Very well, sir. There are twenty sail of the line, sir. Very well, sir. There are twenty-five sail of the line. Twenty-seven, sir. Enough, sir. No more of that. The die is cast. And if there are fifty sail, I will go through them. That was the sort of spirit that motivated the Royal Navy. Nelson had transferred his flag to the captain, HMS Captain, a ship of 74 guns. His actions in HMS Captain at the Battle of Cape St Vincent turned the tide in Britain's favour. The captain sailed into the bow of a San Nicolas, a Spanish ship of 80 guns. Nelson took the San Nicolas by boarding. He actually led the boarding party himself. Meanwhile, another Spanish ship, an even bigger Spanish ship, The 112-gun San Joseph got tangled up on the other side of the San Nicolas. Nelson again led the boarding party from the San Nicolas onto the San Joseph, capturing two Spanish ships that were both more than, more than his size and the crew, they probably outnumbered them three to one. Spanish ships always had heavier crews, there were two bigger ships. His crew were probably outnumbered three to one, but they captured two Spanish. When Nelson led his boarding party with typical, typical bravado, he shouted out, Westminster Abbey or victory. This method of capturing this enemy ship was jokingly referred to as Nelson's patent bridge for capturing a first rate. Nelson's ship was a second rate man of war. The San Nicholas was a second rate man of war. 
The 112-gun San Joseph was a first-rate man of war. It was very unusual for a much smaller ship to capture a, a much larger ship, and Nelson captured two in one go. After the Battle of St Vincent, Nelson was made a Rear Admiral and became a Knight of the Bath to become Sir Horatio Nelson. Soon after that, he was given his first independent command and attacked Tenerife in the Spanish Canary Islands. Yeah, this was the battle at which he got his second famous wound. Uh, he was, while they were trying to storm Santa Cruz, he got a musket ball in the right arm just above the elbow. Uh, and the surgeons had no choice but to cut it off halfway between the elbow and the shoulder. And uh, that was that for his right arm. So he celebrated his first independent command by the loss of a limb. And um, it healed after a few months. But uh, ever afterwards, apparently, the uh, sailors on his ship would gauge his moods according to the movement of his right arm. Because when he was agitated, the stump would wag. And they'd say, oh, there's the Admiral working his fin again. By August 1798, Nelson was in command of a small fleet in the Mediterranean, now on board HMS Vanguard. At the same time, Napoleon was kitting out an expedition in Toulon, ready to attack Egypt. At first, the British didn't know where the French expeditionary force was heading, but while off Sardinia, Nelson heard that the French had reached and left Malta. He immediately guessed they'd be heading for Alexandria in Egypt. He sailed there so quickly he got there before the French, and as there was no sign of them, he backtracked to Sicily, resupplied, sailed for Penapolese, and hearing that the French had been seen off Crete four weeks earlier, sped with his fleet back to Alexandria. As the British fleet sailed past Alexandria, the French fleet was spotted lying at anchor in Abukir Bay. Now the French thought they were completely impregnable here because they were lying tight into the bay, their shoals in front of them, shoals behind and to the side, and as far as they're concerned, the only chance the English have got is to come along in front of them, which means that each English ship is going to be coming past a fully loaded French gun battery as it comes along. This position cannot be attacked. But uh, Nelson had gone through the possible battle plans with all his captains before they made contact with the French, and he'd explained to them what they should do automatically in the event of each and every eventuality. So one of the plans was if the French are lying tight in an anchor, this is what you've got to do. Yes, so the Goliath, HMS Goliath, came in. The French thought you couldn't get round this way because it, it's shoals, low-lying sandbanks. The Goliath, because we were good sailors, the British seamen's ship was second to none. The Goliath sailed round this way. The next British ship sailed this way. This French ship was being attacked on both sides. They didn't even load their guns on this side, the French, because they didn't think it was possible to get round behind. This ship was being double teamed, smashed the hell out of. The next ships came, sailed down the side, sailed down the side, and destroyed the French sheep fleet in succession. Nelson on HMS Vanguard again, smashing into the French, smashing into the French, sinking them and destroying them one at a time. HMS Belleferon, one of my favourite ships, the Billy Ruffian, smashing into the 120-gun French fag ship Le Orient. The French ships at this end of the line were steadily being driven onto the shore or being captured. It should have been a fair fight. An equal ship, equal numbers of ships but the French were just no match for the British. By 10 o'clock, the Orient, 120 guns, totally exploded, blew into the air. The other ships started surrendering. The British ships moved up the line, taking the French one at a time. Eventually, thank you Nick, <laughs> more reinforcements coming. Eventually, the last two French ships and two light frigates saw the writing on the wall and ran away. Nelson said afterwards, it wasn't so much a victory, more of a conquest. During the Battle of the Nile, Nelson was again wounded. He was hit on the left side of his temple, 
by a piece of shrapnel or something similar, and a big flap of skin was almost hacked off, so it fell over his eye with the blood. He actually thought he'd lost the sight of his eye, but once they got him down into the surgery, they were quite easily able to put it back. The battle itself turned out to be the most complete victory at sea up to that date. It totally destroyed French naval power in the Mediterranean and left Napoleon marooned in Egypt. After the battle, Nelson suffered recurring bouts of illness which weren't helped by his wound. He went to recuperate in Sicily where the court of the Kingdom of Naples was located. Nelson evacuated the court from Naples to escape the French army in December 1798. He'd already been made Duke of Bronte by the King of Naples. The British ambassador, Sir Hamilton, who was an old codger, had a wife, Lady Hamilton, and it was she who nursed Nelson back to health from his head wound. They'd met before, now he'd lost an arm and an eye and had a severe head wound, but in nursing him back to health, she fell in love and they began an affair. Nelson spent two years in the Mediterranean with the Hamiltons, ignoring calls from the Admiralty to come home. Eventually he did and took an overland route back through Europe. Nelson finally came back from his travels through Europe. Uh, he had to get a, a mail boat across the North Sea because the Admiralty were displeased with him for the length of time he'd been away and the fact that they knew that he was messing around with somebody else's wife. It simply wasn't done, particularly at that time. Uh, so he came across in this rather ignoble boat. But nevertheless, when he landed in Great Yarmouth, there was a fantastic response from the ordinary people and the, the mayor and all the dignitaries of the town. Uh, the sailors there insisted on unhooking the horses from the carriage and dragging the carriage themselves through the streets of Great Yarmouth, through the cheering crowds. He was given the freedom of the town uh, by the mayor and the dignitaries. The sailors then dragged the coach and Nelson through the wild crowds to the Wrestlers Inn, which is still in Norfolk today. Once the carriage and the crowds had got to the wrestlers' inn, Nelson gave a speech to all the assembled Norfolk people there and delighted them with the phrase, I am a Norfolk man and glory in being so. Back in England, Emma Hamilton bore him a daughter, Horatia, in January 1801. In the same year, he was promoted to Vice Admiral. On one occasion, he met the famous artist Benjamin West, who painted a famous picture of General Wolfe dying at his moment of glory at Quebec. They met at a dinner, and Nelson asked him why he hadn't painted any others like it. Because, my lord, there are no more subjects, said West. Damn it, I didn't think of that, replied Nelson. My lord, I fear your intrepidity may yet furnish me with another such scene, and if it should, I shall certainly avail myself of it. Will you, Mr West? Then I hope I shall die in my next battle. That was the typical Nelson remark. Nelson's jacket had a trademark four orders on it. One was the Order of the Bath, and the other three were awarded by European sovereigns in gratitude for his victory at the Battle of the Nile. Wearing these orders on his jacket were to be his undoing, as it made him very easily identifiable, as he found to his cost at the Battle of Trafalgar. In March 1801, Nelson sailed from Great Yarmouth for Denmark under the command of Admiral Parker and in the ship HMS Elephant. The mission was to teach the Danes a lesson. They'd been allying with Sweden and Russia and possibly were looking like they were going to combine with France in attacking Britain and that would have been a very dangerous combination of naval forces. Nelson was tasked with attacking Copenhagen, the base for the Danish fleet, which was very heavily defended with shore batteries. When he attacked, the Danes reacted furiously and a very vicious fight took place. Admiral Parker was several miles away and was looking at the action and thought, incorrectly, that the English were getting the worst of it. He sent a signal to Nelson asking for him to withdraw. Yes, this was one of those instances where Nelson refused to obey orders. Probably correctly so, because he was close enough to the action to see that, in fact, it was going well and it just needed finishing off. So he didn't want to see this signal, so it's the famous incident where he's supposed to have held his telescope up to his blind eye and said, I really do not see the signal, carried on with the attack and won a very substantial victory. Splinters were flying above, below, when Nelson sailed the sound. Mark you, I wouldn't be elsewhere now, said he, for a thousand pound. The Admiral's signal bade him fly, but he wickedly wagged his head. He clapped the glass to his sightless eye, and I'm damned if I see it, he said. 
Yes, and there ever after that, to say you Copenhagen someone means you go in and do a, a strike first and you wipe them out before they can resist you. For the loss of his eye and his arm, Bob Nelson does declare. Enemies of his country, not an inch of them he'll spare. The Danes he's made to do the day they ever Paul did join. A gypsy burn and poured, he'd sunk and took six of the line. Raise your drink to Gallant Nelson, the wonder of the world. Who in defence of Britain, his thunder loud was hurled. And to his brave and valiant tars that plough the raging sea. Who never were afraid to face a daring enemy. With his thundering and roaring, rattling and roaring. Thundering and roaring bombs With its thundering and roaring Rattling and roaring Thundering and roaring bombs Soon after the Battle of Copenhagen, Nelson was made Viscount Nelson of the Nile and Burnham Thorpe. In May 1803, Nelson hoisted his flag on HMS Victory. HMS Victory had 104 guns spread over three decks. The wood was from 2,000 oak trees, enough to cover 60 acres of forest. This is why Nelson's great friend, Admiral Collingwood, always carried around with him a pocket full of acorns to plant. And here she is in all her glory, HMS Victory. The Victory also had 27 miles of rigging and four acres of canvas spread over 32 sails. It took over 850 crew to sail the ship and their average age was only 22. HMS Victory was built in Chatham in 1759, the year after Nelson was born, but it wasn't actually launched until 1765. It was a type of ship that dominated navies until the 1850s. Nelson sailed for the Mediterranean to blockade the French Admiral Villeneuve in Toulon to prevent the French and their allies the Spanish from gathering a huge fleet to protect Napoleon's invasion flotilla which was assembling at Boulogne. In March 1804 Villeneuve broke out, slipping through the blockade and across the Atlantic to the West Indies. Nelson gave chase and protected the West Indian colonies from French attack and the French and Spanish skulked back across the Atlantic to Europe. On the 10th of August 1805, Nelson returned to England to confer with the Admiralty and landed here at Portsmouth Point. Nelson had a rare month of domestic happiness with Emma and their daughter Horatia at their house in Merton, south of London. But it was cut short. Napoleon had ordered his fleet to sea again and Nelson was the man to stop him. Nelson got his coach down from London and arrived here. This is the site of the George Hotel, where he stayed the night, his last night in England. Unfortunately, the hotel itself was bombed in 1941, so it's uh, been replaced by this block of flats. When news of his arrival in Portsmouth became known, crowds gathered and blocked the high street. This is actually Portsmouth High Street here. To escape from the crowds that had gathered outside the front of the George, Nelson came out the back way and came up here towards Penny Street. From Penny Street over in that direction, Nelson cut across South Sea Common, which we're on now, and down onto South Sea Beach, which is just over to my left, and got a barge that was waiting for him from HMS Victory. The crowds that had been outside the George realised Nelson had got out the back door and followed him down here. There were thousands of people mobbing him as he left, waiting to see their hero go off on his last battle. The army even had to hold them back. As the crowds pressed forward and the army tried to keep them back, Nelson waved his hat in the air and they gave him three cheers. He turned to Hardy, Captain Hardy, and said to him, I've had their hussars before, Hardy, but now I have their hearts. He left England on the 14th of September. Two weeks later, on the 28th of September, he was back with a main fleet off Cadiz, off Spain, waiting for the French and the Spanish to appear. It's October the 21st, 1805, off Cape Trafalgar, and Nelson has finally caught up with the Franco-Spanish fleet. 
27 ships on Nelson's side, 33 ships on Admiral Villeneuve, the French Admiral's side. It was more than fair enough odds for us. Up until this period, there had been a tendency in naval battles basically to want to get in, capture a couple of ships, and that was the end of the battle. Nelson had a different attitude. He wanted to annihilate the enemy whenever possible. And uh, as the Battle of Trafalgar approached, over dinner parties in his cabin with the captains of all the ships in his fleet, he'd explained to them and drummed into them time and time again what they were going to do. And his battle plan was simple but ruthless. He told them that when they encountered the French fleet sailing, they'd form either three or two lines, the, the British fleet, and they'd sail through and they'd break, cut the French line. With the idea being that the first third of the French ships would still for some time be carried sailing on. They'd take time to turn because they weren't particularly good seamen in any case. Quite possibly, knowing the ferocious reputation of the Royal Navy by this stage, they wouldn't even want to come back and mix it if they could avoid it. So he knew that by cutting their line in two or three places, the first third or so would be out of the battle until it was too late. So his captains knew that, uh, they knew what to do, and now having sighted the French fleets about six hours before the battle actually starts, they're sailing in two columns towards the French line. The French and Spanish fleets had effectively been playing cat and mouse with the British for the best part of two years. Uh, Napoleon had hankered to invade England. He had an invasion fleet in terms of his manpower est established at Boulogne for quite some time. And he was getting impatient with his French and Spanish allies, the Navy, uh, because this invasion simply hadn't happened. And he'd ordered Admiral Villeneuve basically to pull his finger out and get involved. So the French and the Spanish allies were sailing from port to port off the Spanish coast. Uh, Villeneuve, the French admiral, he had a, a battle plan. Quite simply, he knew that Nelson was likely to try to break through the column. The best way to deal with that would have been to have had a second line of ships. So as they broke through the first one, they hammered with the second line. Unfortunately for Villeneuve, the level of seamanship of the French and particularly of Spanish allies is sufficiently poor that this was the best they could get by way of forming a second line. So they simply hadn't got it together. For which I think really there's no excuse because there's a very light wind uh, following behind their fleets. The British take a good six hours from when the two fleets sight each other until they're actually really within the battle range. For the last hour of the approach, in fact, the, the British sheeps at the front of each column are under continual fire. So the Victory, which is a, a ship of a first-rate ship of just over 100 guns, nevertheless is being fired on by four or five larger Spanish ships for a full hour, full broadsides, uh, before she even fires a single shot. The same with Collingwood, who's at the head of the other column in the Royal Sovereign. Again, a first-rater, 102 guns, and both these ships take a terrible pounding as in the last hour they're inching towards the French lines. And you can imagine the commanders of the French guns basically saying to their men, look, for God's sake, get them, get their masts off, because the French continually aimed at the mast to try to disable the ships. And of course, if they could disable the Victory and the Royal Sovereign at the head of the column, then the other ships would tend to just hang around behind them and they could pound them. So they're trying to take the masts off first. But um, inch by inch, the British column comes closer and the French, in the end, fail to stop them. And six hours after the action, in effect, begins, the two British columns crash through the French lines. It was eight bells ringing, for the morning watch was done, and the gunners' lads were singing as they polished every gun. It was eight bells ringing, and the gunners' lads were singing, for the ship she rode a swinging as they polished every gun. One of the key factors in this battle was that the English were certain of victory, the French and Spanish were confident that they would lose. During these long six hours when the two English lines are inching their way towards the larger French and Spanish force, Nelson, always aware of the factor of his men's morale, realised that they needed something to, to keep the morale up. And he turned to his flag officer and said, I will now amuse the fleet with a signal. And at this point, he scrawled into his pocketbook the signal to hand to the man, and he wrote down, England confides every man will do his duty. And the flag officer looked at this 
and realise that Confide is significantly harder to spell in semaphore. I think perhaps also he thought it's uh, a more complicated word. So he suggested to Nelson that he simplify it, and Nelson agreed. So the signal actually hoisted was the world famous signal now, I still remember to this day, England expects every man will do his duty. Nelson wanted to get involved in what he described to his captains before the battle as a pell-mell battle. Everyone involved right in the thick of it. He'd also told his captains in advance of what was expected of them. It's quite simple. He said to them, no captain can do very wrong if he places his ship alongside that of an enemy. Just before the victory crashed through the French lines at the head of the second column of the British fleet, Nelson had flown the second famous signal of the day, engaged the enemy more closely. And this signal remained flying from the yardarm of the victory until it was shot off later on during the battle. As victory crashed through the line, it raked a broadside into the rear of the Bucanture, the French flagship, and then crashed against the Redoutable, and a big pell-mell battle broke out right in the centre of the French line. Nelson had been advised by his brother officers that in the thick of a battle such as this, he shouldn't wear his very distinctive flashy uniform, his jacket, and they advised him to change it for something rather more bland. Now, Nelson refused to do this for a number of reasons. First of all, he regarded the use of sharpshooters to pick off individual officers as a thoroughly un-British, underhand, typically dirty frog sort of trick, and he simply didn't approve of it. He saw this as a battle between ships, and taking out a single officer was something very, very wrong. So he didn't approve of the, the very idea of being shot for a start like that in these circumstances. Secondly, and I think more important, he felt it would give a very bad example to his men. It would imply that he was scared. Uh, and he, for his own reasons of personal vanity and the, the myth he was cultivating himself about himself, couldn't afford that. And he also knew it couldn't be afforded on the more practical level of impact on the men's morale. So he was determined to keep on strutting around the ship in the middle of the battle in this splendid uniform, uh, which was, I suppose really, a mistake, unless he actually wanted to be killed. If you look back, every single battle almost, he said before the battle, I'm either going to do really well in this battle, I'm either going to get some uh, immense ennoblement out of it, or I'm going to be sent back home dead and buried in Westminster Abbey. And he kept on saying this. I think he probably had a bit of a martyrdom complex, especially if he realised the sight in his second eye was going. I think he probably didn't care. So there he is, walking around on the victory in this full uniform, and in the mizzenmast of the French ship Redoutable, there's a French sharpshooter with a musket but a man handpicked for his sharpshooting abilities and uh, he's up there in the mast at very very close range just towering over the victory. Yes it's probably only about 15 yards range. He's fired the bullet, a fateful bullet at about 1.15. It came down and hit Nelson about here on his body he was walking with Hardy on the deck. He fell back into the arms of some Marines and cried out, Hardy, they have done for me at last. My back is shot through. The bullet came down at an angle and lodged in the base of Nelson's spine. Nelson was carried down to the ship surgery, which was right down in the bowels of the ship. Still conscious, obviously in great pain, and the battle still going on pell-mell all around him. You could, obviously they'd hear the, the thundering roar of the cannons uh, even down that far in the ship's hull. And uh, he made it clear that he, he wanted everyone in the fleet to know, especially the men on his ship, that he was still in charge. He was going to remain in charge until the moment he died. And he in fact continued giving orders, even though uh, suffering from a great deal of internal bleeding. He was basically gradually filling up with blood. Uh, he was very thirsty, so they gave him large quantities of lemonade. Uh, so he's dying, he knows he's dying, but he wants to hang on long enough to hear the scale of the victory. 
Now, he'd set himself a target of taking 20 French ships, basically to annihilate any future possibility of a Franco-Spanish invasion, to do so much damage to their fleet. And he hung on for hmm, more than three hours, and he was told at the end of this period, by about half past four, that the battle was won, They'd taken 19 French ships, so he's just one short of his target. But nevertheless, he's thoroughly satisfied with that. And his last words, basically, the two famous sets of last words, kiss me hardy, but the most important thing from him, from the point of view of, as the admiral of the fleet, his last words were, thank God I've done my duty, when he heard that the French and Spanish fleet had effectively been utterly destroyed. Every man is expected his duty to do Was the last signal made to the British fleet's crew Let your watchword be Nelson, ye sons of the main When you fight and you conquer again and again Success to old England, the land of the free Success to our sovereign, the queen of the sea Success to her sailors, the lords of the main Success to the navy again and again Nelson's Prayer May the great God whom I worship grant to my country and for the benefit of Europe in general a great and glorious victory and may no misconduct in any one tarnish it. And may humanity, after victory, be the predominant feature of the British fleet. For myself individually, I commit my life to him who made me. And may this blessing light upon my endeavours for serving my country faithfully. To him I resign myself and the just cause which is entrusted to me to defend. Amen. 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 Nelson had always said that he wanted to be buried in Westminster Abbey until he found out that it was actually damp and low-lying, whereupon he changed his mind and suggested St Paul's Cathedral. But he'd also particularly insisted that he must not be buried at sea. They therefore put the Admiral's body into a cask, a giant barrel of rum, and proceeded to sail home for Lon uh, heading towards London. Partway through the voyage, the level of the rum in the barrel was checked, and the officers found to their horror that it had dropped really dramatically. Uh, either it was leaking, or, as the rumour had it, the seamen were going in, sneaking a tot of this mixture of Nelson's blood and the rum for good luck. In any case, they topped it back up with brandy, and thus preserved, Nelson was taken back to Greenwich. Once in Greenwich, Nelson's body was taken from the Victory and he was laid in state in the Great Hall of the Royal Naval College, where his body was seen by an estimated 30,000 people, a huge number at the time. Nelson's huge state funeral took place on the 9th of January, 1806. His body was rowed up the Thames and then the procession went on to St Paul's Cathedral. Nelson was buried in a coffin made of oak taken from the mainmast of the French flagship at the Battle of the Nile, L'Oreal. After it exploded, the mainmast was picked out of the water, made into a coffin, and Nelson had carried this around with him ever since. The coffin was then placed inside a marble sarcophagus, which had been built for Cardinal Wolsey 300 years earlier. Nelson lies in St Paul's Cathedral to this day, surrounded by several of the other captains, including his close friend Collingwood, who was also buried there. How was Nelson remembered after he died? Well, there was a vast amount of memorabilia that went out, and it's still out to this day. Toby jugs, cups, children's books. Every child had a book about Nelson where they learnt the tales of his youth and his battles. And then, of course, there's the most famous of all, Nelson's Column, in the centre of Trafalgar Square. There's also a Nelson's Monument in Great Yarmouth. This was paid for from public subscription and is 144 feet high, crowned by a statue of Britannia facing inland towards Burnham Thorpe. The four major actions and the names of his ships are on each face, as indeed they are in Nelson's Column in Trafalgar Square. This Yarmouth monument was originally in the centre of Great Yarmouth Racecourse, but it's now become a dilapidated industrial estate. Perhaps one day, in happier times to come, it'll be moved to somewhere much more fitting. 
Nelson's final and greatest victory at Trafalgar in 1805 was complemented ten years later by Wellington's crushing defeat of Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo. Not for the first time and not for the last time, Britain had saved the whole of Europe from tyranny. As the defeated Napoleon was taken to final exile on St Helena on board the HMS Bellerophon, he turned to the captain of the ship and said ruefully that he would have won, but wherever there was water, I found you in my way. What he really meant was time and time again, the French fleet came up against Nelson. At the crucial moments of decision throughout British history, great men have arisen, often in the nick of time, to save us from mortal danger. Great men, giants, but among all of those giants, nobody has ever stood taller than Admiral Horatio Nelson. Mm -hmm.